Hello and welcome. I hope that you are having a fantastic day. We're going to talk about Bitcoin news today. Now in the news is Libra and central bank digital currency and we're going to do a little bit of watching. We're going to check them out from a distance because what's happening with Libra and central bank digital currencies is exciting and it could have a dramatic impact on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular uh, in the near future, in the short term. So to see Libra's potential, look at the Philippines, not the US. We're gonna look in today's video, we're gonna cover three different articles. The first article we're gonna look at is Bitcoin HODL wave data has now been calling for a bull run for five months. Then we're going to take a look at an article called First Mover, Bitcoin Could Get a Boost from Central Bank Digital Currencies. And then we're going to wrap it up with an article called To See Libra's Potential, Look at the Philippines, Not the United States. So should I buy Bitcoin now or should I wait? We're going to give you ideas to help you take profits and avoid losses. Can we get 99 likes on this video? We need you to smash the like button. It really helps us out and it, it makes a huge difference with the YouTube algorithms in terms of them ranking this video higher. So I'm not a financial advisor and this is not financial advice. This is my opinion. Now cryptocurrency involves a lot of risk. If you're going to invest in cryptocurrency, take this disclaimer seriously. It really is important because it is a very risky investment. Now, when it comes to investing in cryptocurrency, I want to give you a little bit of historical data. Now, as always, historical data does not necessarily reflect future performance, but it's valuable in understanding potential. So if you took $1,000 and bought Bitcoin on January 1, 2017 and did absolutely nothing for three years and then sold that, uh, uh, that Bitcoin on December 31st, 2019, you would receive $7,206. That's not bad for a three-year investment. This chart, <coughs> excuse me, this chart shows you the results of doing that for three year periods starting from 2011 going all the way to 2019. And so take a look at this chart. The, the most important thing to get from it is if you buy Bitcoin, hold on to it for three years and then sell it according to the past data. In fact, uh, from 2011 to 2019, there's not a day when you couldn't have bought Bitcoin, held it for three years, and made a profit. And so uh, it was 100% during that, uh, what is that, eight-year period. And so there's a strong, in my opinion, this is my opinion, there's a strong potential that if you buy Bitcoin, hold it for three years, that you'll end up making money. Anyway, Let's get into things. So first of all, let's take a look at the Bitcoin market right now. Right now, Bitcoin is at $9,118 and it is currently 641 Central Standard Time on May 27th, 2020. I can tell you that in the last, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, somewhere in that ballpark approximately, Bitcoin has gone up about $200-ish because when I first started preparing to do this video, uh, the price of Bitcoin was below the 9,000 mark. It was around 8,800 and something or other, 880. Um, I don't recall because I wasn't paying real super close attention, but I have noticed now that I opened up this page that Bitcoin has gone up several percent, several hundred dollars in the last 40, 50 minutes. Um, currently, Bitcoin has a dominance of 66%, so this has also gone up because a day or so, Bitcoin's dominance was 65% according to its uh, uh, market cap. All right, so the Bitcoin HODL wave data has now been calling for a bull run for five months. Imagine that, five months. These bulls have been pent up for five months. 
Bitcoin BTC is more likely to be at the start of a new bull market than at any time since 2016, new data covering investors suggests. Now, the data shows that 60% of the Bitcoin supply has not moved from its wallet in over a year. And so, really, the statement that they're making here about uh, Bitcoin uh, is at the start of a new bull run, uh, similar to like since ni- since 2016. The primary thing that they're looking at is how much of the Bitcoin supply has not moved in a 12-month or greater period of time. And it's very interesting. I hadn't seen this chart before, but I thought it was fascinating and wanted to put it into this video. Looking at Swift's accompanying chart, there is a strong relationship between the amount of supply lying dormant and subsequent upward price action. So it's almost like these people who are holding on to Bitcoin and have held it for a year or more know something about what's about to happen. 60% of all Bitcoin has not moved on the blockchain for at least one year. This is an indication of significant hodling. The last time this happened was in early 2016 at the start of the bull run. And so this faint orange line here is the percentage of people who are holding Bitcoin and not doing anything with it. And this blue line is the price of Bitcoin, but it is on a logarithmic chart because this value right here is $1,000. This value here is is basically $20,000, but this value is $10,000. So, um, and this value is at $10. So the, the this is a logarithmic chart for the price of Bitcoin. And so it goes up much, much faster than you would normally expect um, because the move from right here, right about in here to here is $10,000. But this is also the $10,000 price range. So from here to here, you go from $10,000 to $20,000. But from here to here is $10,000. And so it's, it's what they call a logarithmic chart where it compresses the numbers um, as you get higher and higher. Anyway, all of that aside, here's the important thing to notice. When the number of people, uh, the number of, of the percentage of Bitcoin that has not moved in 12 months or more is high, you can see that it, 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 people were holding as Bitcoin was going up. But once it hit a certain peak, then people started selling off And that's why we see this great big dip down as the percentage of holders of Bitcoin drops into the 40% mark. And so they go from 60% as a high all the way down to in around 40% as a low for people that have been holding Bitcoin for a year or more. And you can see here that we had a significant jump up just before 2020 um, and we've been holding steady at this level and we're above 60% or right in the 60% range. So the chart shows patterns of Bitcoin supply movement known as HODL waves. The 60% mark suggests that Bitcoin is at the most advantageous point in its current wave for long-term investors. As Cointelegraph reported in March, similar data from Unchained Capital previously revealed that those who bought Bitcoin during the 2018 crash to $3,100 are also holding on to their investment. <clears throat> and so people, are, people are, are, are aware that Bitcoin has the potential to go up significantly and so they're buying it and they're just holding on to it in anticipation of some significant moves. Let's get on to the other news. So first mover, Bitcoin could get a boost from central bank digital currencies. And so here's a chart for Bitcoin's prices. The green line is 10,000. This is 9,000. This is 8,000 on the blue line. With the near term picture cloudy, some analysts are focusing on a longer term trend that could be surprisingly bullish for Bitcoin. The emergence of digital currencies issued by central banks. It's not an obvious investment thesis because Bitcoin was invested to be used in an electronic peer-to-peer payment system that would be free of government control and operate outside of the traditional banking system. 
and most central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, would by their very nature be issued and controlled by governments, and in many cases be distributed through banks. But Jack Purdy and Ryan Watkins of the research firm firm Masari wrote last week in a report that the coming digitization of money, including the launch of CBDCs, could provide a secular tailwind for Bitcoin. CBDCs have gained momentum over the past years as countries consider whether to roll out digital versions of their currencies to keep up with Facebook's proposed Libra and China's forthcoming digital uh, digital currency electronic payment, which is already in the testing. I didn't intend to open that article. So, the journal Central Banking, which is supported by the Bank of International Settlements and the European Central Bank, among others, found in a survey earlier this month that some 46 countries are considering central bank digital currencies using a constrained form of distributed ledger technology. And so they're looking at using the same kind of technology that is the backbone to Bitcoin and to most of the other cryptocurrencies. But when they say that they're going to use a constrained form of it, what they're basically saying is is it's going to be centrally controlled by the government and they're going to do certain things to limit and control the, the CBDCs as they're introduced. You know, especially China. China is not a free country. China is a country under uh, uh, the dictatorship of of their leader, and they have extremely strict controls. Um, And and so you don't expect China to come out with something that's uh, as free and forward thinking as Bitcoin, where it can't be controlled by governments. China's central bank digital currency is going to have a lot of back-end constraints and controls built in by the Chinese government so that they can monitor things. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell told Congress in February that the U.S. central bank is in the early stages of researching digital currencies and that having a single government currency at the heart of the financial system is something that has served us well. Even so, J.P. Morgan said last week in a report that there is no country with more to lose from the disruptive potential of digital currencies than the United States. As reported by Bloomberg News, this revolves primarily around the U.S. dollar hegemony. The largest U.S. bank's warning merely reinforces the urgency and significance of the effort, and that's what the Masari analysis were homing in on. So this really is important, and I don't want to skip over it. J.P. Morgan is one of the largest banks in the world. And when J.P. Morgan comes out and says that the United States has more to lose than any other country because of central bank digital currencies, um, then you would hope that the United States would stand up and pay attention. Um, And so, you know, if the U.S. loses its dominance as the world's reserve currency, that will significantly harm or uh, do damage to the entire U.S. economy and make things much, much more difficult for those of the United States. It will help some countries and and it will also hurt other countries. And so it just depends on which country uh, you live in and which country you're partaking on. The largest U.S. bank's warning merely reinforces the urgency and significance of the effort, and that's what the Masari analysis was homing in on. Sorry, I didn't mean to read that a second time, but then again, after I started reading it, I was like, you know what? This statement is worth repeating, and it is worth taking note of. Catalyzed by Bitcoin, the recognition of the benefits of blockchain technology, many countries and companies around the world have begun researching, testing, and launching their own digital currencies, the analysts wrote. With these, when these projects launch, they will have a combined effect of exposing billions of people to cryptocurrency-related technologies, according to the report. This will increase people's comfort with and understanding of cryptocurrencies and get more people creating and using cryptocurrency wallets and provide on-ramps into decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. 
So we could be on the verge of something really, really huge. I personally tend to think so, but time will tell. So to see Libra's potential, look at the Philippines, not the United States. I'm going to skip a little bit of this. Now is not the time to look away from Libra. With 1.7 billion unbanked people around the world and a global resistance remittance market buckling under the pressure of a pandemic, Facebook and friends are saying they'll pony up to deliver world payment rails that could finally solve the challenge of onboarding the masses, banked or not, to the digital economy. Even with the remaining regulatory hurdles in their way, this could be an enticing proposal for central banks that lack the means to develop their own central bank digital currency, or those looking to hedge their central bank digital currency bets while they wait to see how the rest of the world moves to navigate this new frontier. Take the Philippines as an example. I've lived in the Philippines, and that's not me personally, just the person who wrote the article. He, the, the author of the article has lived in the Philippines since 2018, and is not, it's not hard to imagine how fast Libra could become the preferred tender of the Philippines, of Filipinos everywhere. To paint a picture, while very few are banked, only 22.6% uh, of adults have a bank account. The number of mobile phone subscriptions is greater than the number of actual people who live here. Also, according to an annual report by Hootsuite and We Are Social, if a Filipino has access to the internet, that's two-thirds of the 109 million population, that person is on Facebook. So even though they don't have bank accounts, two-thirds of them are Facebook users. In fact, Filipinos have the most active social media users in the world for five years running. Wow, I had no idea about that until I read this article. I did not know that the Filipinos were more active than anybody else around the world on Facebook. At nearly four hours every day, they dedicate more time to social media than anyone else anywhere. The global daily average is just two hours and 24 minutes. So in other words, they've almost, uh, well, I was going to say doubled the global media average, uh, but this is nearly four hours versus almost two and a half hours. So it's not quite double. It's maybe uh, 70% more than the rest of the world, which still is a dramatic, uh, a significant amount more than everybody else. Um, and, and, and for Facebook, I, I don't understand why the Filipinos have such a, um, trying to think of the right word, uh, why the Filipinos use Facebook so much and spend so much of their daily time on Facebook. So um, that would be something that I would be interested in knowing more about. Now, overlay this mobile-first, tech-savvy culture with the reality that Philippines are, is still a cash-based society struggling to include the vast majority of its citizens in the mainstream financial system. In 2018, digital payments accounted for just 10% of the total volume of payments in the Philippines. The Banco Sentinel Philippine, Filipinas, BSP, aimed to increase this to 30% by 2020, but we're not there yet. Even with the rapid rise of e-commerce, 83% of Filipinos are known to search for what they want online, only to go into the store to purchase with cash. COVID-19 might force in-store behaviors like this to change, but still, where items are home-delivered, 93% of Filipinos will pay cash on delivery. And so it's interesting that Filipinos have a history of using cash. So a Libra peso could quickly iron out inefficiencies due to Facebook's utility and Libra's likeness to cash as opposed to credit. Libra has the potential to become mainstream because Facebook's large user base, which could positively impact the broader blockchain space, says Adding the BSP has been crypto forward since the early days, 
having committed to reaching the financially underserved through digital innovation. In a poor country where Facebook is the internet, Libra could be the money. So I, I think they make a really strong argument why Facebook could, Facebook's Libra cryptocurrency could really take off in the Philippines. So if you're unbanked and you spend the majority of your paycheck in cash, why would you go to the extra effort traveling all the way to the bank just to queue up, deposit your money, and then it get burned with account and transaction fees? So maybe the fees and the transaction costs of using a bank are, are pretty high. Unlike the United States where, hey, you open up a free account and the only time you get you know, charged exorbitant fees is when you bounce a check or something similar. But for many people, such as millions of vulnerable households that rely on money being sent home by family members who work overseas, the cashing in and out process is unavoidable. Making up nearly 10% of the Philippine GDP, remittances are an exceptionally slow, clunky, and costly business locked in a paper-based era of brick-and-mortar inefficiencies. So, <clears throat> excuse me again. This is where Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg's vision really rings true. If it was easy to send money to the Philippines as it is to send a photo via Facebook Messenger, ah, now we see the real idea. So if it's as easy to send money as a Filipino can send a picture of his family via Facebook, and if the recipients could pay for all that they need with the app, they'd never have to cash out again. This is the real opportunity for Libra. Eliminating the need to cash in and out could eliminate cash forever in the Philippines. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, and I think they're a long ways from that. Um, but you actually could see a time where they completely replace cash with some form of digital currency. Say that the BSP goes and airdrops free money, Libra pesos, to Facebook users. That's what PayPal paid its customers to sign up back in the year 2000. So I had forgotten about this, but yeah, in the early years 2000, PayPal had paid people to create PayPal accounts. The strategy was expensive, but successful, and something like this would be one hell of an incentive program in a country where the average family income is around 22,000 pesos per month or $433 a month. So if you're only making $433 a month, money is tight and you got to figure out how to make every pay, every peso stretch as far as you can. You could get millions upon millions of user registrations in a single day. And so that makes sense to me how you could see dramatic amounts of people registering when they know, especially when 10%, I mean, imagine that, 10% of the economy of the Philippines is based on people sending money home for people, you know, to help out their families, their cousins, their parents, their uh, brothers and sisters, etc., when it's that large of an amount and if Facebook can give them a way where not only is it easier to send the money, but it's also easier for people to spend the money. And that's the, that last part will really be key. Facebook has the infrastructure to make it easy for them to send the money and, and do it via Facebook Messenger, just like you would a picture. The hard part is getting... Uh, local shops and vendors that serve Filipinos uh, <coughs> to accept the Libra as payment. But when that happens, or if that happens, uh, the Libra peso, the Libra version of a peso uh, digital coin, we could, we could see it really taking off. So, how can I be of service to you? Do you have any questions, thoughts, comments? Please leave them in the YouTube channel below. In the meantime, I hope that you'll like, subscribe, and hodl. And hey, do me a huge favor. Have a fantastic day.